And we are live. So my name is Lori. I am a holistic health junkie, advocate, educator, whatever you want to call it. Um, many of you already know me because I am here in my own group, but the, for those who don't know me, um, my background really is in medical transcription, both in the clinical setting and the um, psychiatric setting. Simultaneously, during all of that time working for allopathic medicine, I dabbled in all kinds of holistic, herbal, homeopathic, energy medicines, transformations, all of, all of the things, trying to heal myself along my journey. And one of the ways that I really benefited was not just reading all of the books, not just um, attending seminars, getting certifications, doing the trainings, doing all of the things, but one of the things that really benefited me was just hearing other people's stories. And um, I've asked Annette to join me today because I've been following her content for a little while. And recently, very exciting, she put out a book that really grabbed my attention. The cover is very eye-catching. And for whatever reason, I'm very drawn to dragonflies. And that happens to be the title of her book. So I just reached out to her and said, hey, do you want to do an interview? And she said, yeah, sure. And here we are. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Annette. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So Annette Copeland is a gifted transformational coach who helps her clients break free from negative conditioning and behavior patterns often passed down through generations. She empowers individuals to break out of toxic cycles, raising emotional intelligence, encouraging new mindsets and perspectives and behaviors that will lead them toward flourishing lives. Who doesn't want that? Right. Annette knows that if people can rise above their past, they are then in a position to create something new for themselves and the generations that come after. No matter what a person's plight or circumstance may be, she believes with all of her heart that everyone has it within them to be the best version of themselves. Annette's book, Dragonfly Into the Light is intended to raise awareness and support individuals in becoming more emotionally aware so that they can break free of toxic behaviors and create their best life. Annette Copeland has been an advocate for natural healing since she was a young mom. She worked in a functional medicine clinic for 12 years alongside amazing doctors, instructors, and trailblazers and became a board certified naturopathic doctor in 2015. She is passionate about helping her clients incorporate a holistic approach to health and to encourage emotional growth. Her mission is to empower others to be their own health advocate and create a balanced, fulfilling life for themselves by taking charge of their own mind, body, and spirit. And this is why I love you so much. <laughs> Thank you. That's so sweet. I mean, I, I, that's me right there. I did not become a naturopathic doctor officially. I only earned my degree on Google. So um, thank you for all of that. And I really want to hear about your book. What inspired you to write it? What, how, how, did, how, did, it, how did it get going? How did this come to life? Uh, well, let's see. I started writing this book in 2006. And it kind of started as, I don't know, probably some sort of like therapy for myself. Like I just I needed to write to get some things out and it just kind of turned into something. And I thought, you know, this, this could be a book probably. And then, you know, life happened and I got really busy and I have a daughter who's now 37 and she has four children. So it's, it's been busy. <laughs> So, um, this last year I just kind of committed to finishing the book and it was really perfect timing because I was becoming into somebody that I hadn't been before. And I was really working hard to get through some emotional hurdles that I had personally. And through that process, I learned so much, not only about myself, but how people work inside, like how humans work. And I thought, you know what, not only can I write an amazing story about the topic of to like toxicity and trauma and emotional abuse, I can also add in some tips that I learned along the way and really turn it into a book that someone who reads it 
can say, oh, I didn't know that that was considered abuse for one. And two, here's some awesome ways for me to work on my own toxic behaviors so that maybe I can either remove myself from toxic situations or just grow past the, the shame and the guilt and the regret that they've been carrying around for years. So would you classify this as loosely based on real life example, or do you really just feel like it's fiction and it just kind of came out of the sky and <laughs> you added a little, well, a little no, sprinkle I mean, I've, here and I've had some things that I've had to work through in my lifetime. Um, some of them started when I was a tiny, tiny child. And that's, it's kind of given me a good basis for understanding, but the, the cool thing about it, or I don't know if it was cool, but <laughs> the important thing was I didn't know that the behaviors that I experienced from other people were toxic. And I didn't okay. know that my reaction to those behaviors was also toxic. Okay. So there were a lot of aha moments over the last okay. few years as I was started working my way through those things. And have you yet, I, I mean, maybe, I, I don't know what you've been doing with your time. Maybe you've been writing this whole time, but have you worked with other people? So they've also recognized some of their experiences and they're like, hmm, I did that, that, that I get what you're saying now. I didn't know that was toxic too. I hear that all the time. Um, mostly from women, but I have had a few men actually reach out to me. They're less likely, men seem to be less likely to stand up and say that happened to me because I think it's, there's kind of a stigma attached for men to admit conditioning. Mm -hmm, that someone was abusive to them. And I mean, in all honesty, I really don't want the book to be about abuse. I want okay. it to be about recognizing the patterns and learning how to heal yourself so that yeah. you no longer attract that sort of vibe or whatever into your life so that you can truly live a happier, healthier life. Oh, so and you I didn't answer your last question. No, it, no, you did. Absolutely. It's you did. 100% um, fiction, but okay. there's a lot of life experience that gave me the ideas behind how to do some of those things. I, I would hope so because, you know, so many times you hear people talking at you rather mm -hmm. than talking with you and you know that they're talking at you when, when they just haven't experienced it as yeah. opposed to people who have gone through the, the muck and had to pull themselves up out of that pit, maybe yeah. a couple of times they they just speak differently, right? Yeah. Well, and when you have what in the book, I call them generational curses, um, but generational patterns that have been passed down to you from your ancestors, your grandparents or your parents, like my grandmother lived through the great depression okay. and some of her behaviors because of living through that were passed down to the rest of us. She worried sure. constantly sure. about everything. And Do you feel comfortable giving examples like. I know there's people our age that are probably going to listen to this and be like, what do you mean? My grandma yeah. was there too. <laughs> well, I mean, so examples of generational patterns that have been passed down, worry would be one with absolutely like no skills to deal with the worry. It's just constant. Okay. Um, and something else, like for an example, if you say, say you lived in a great house and your parents were amazing people and you had an amazing childhood. And I hear this one all the time. My childhood was amazing. I was not abused. Great, happy. I'm, gl I'm glad that you don't feel like you were abused. But say your parents were having an adult conversation about something that they didn't want you to be involved in. And instead of saying, honey, daddy and I are going to have a conversation about something that we don't really want you to have to listen to. So could you please go do something else? Go read a book, go play outside, whatever. We're going to have a conversation and it's, it's just really doesn't apply to you. So, you know, go do something else. Or they said, go to your room. And you were like, what am I in trouble? What, why, why do I have to go to my room? And then you're instantly in that like fight or flight kicks in because, and we talked about this briefly yesterday, um, 
so consider when you're hundreds of years ago, when people were living as nomads and in tribes and in small villages, the community is what kept people alive because not everybody had the same skills. One person knew how to build a house. One person knew how to hunt. One person knew how to take care of herbs and things to keep you healthy, whatever. The community togetherness is what kept you alive. If a bear came after you, there were people to help you fight the bear off. If you were ostracized and sent to the woods by yourself and you had no community with you, your chances of survival were very slim. And humans are meant to have community. They're meant to have connections with other people. So there's a mental component and there's also a physically dangerous component to being ostracized from the group. Yeah. And because human beings, we have um, evolved in so many ways but our root DNA, like our bodies, like the, our vagus nerve and all of those things, our fight or flight system has not evolved as quickly as our brains have. So our emotional system isn't as evolved. So when somebody says, go to your room without any explanation, the child is then left to try to figure out what happened on their own. And they don't have the experience that adults have. And so they, they have these feelings. It. Right. And they have these feelings, but they don't even know why they have the feelings. Right. So let alone learn now, now they have to know how to navigate it. They don't even know why they're feeling in a certain way. Right. And or say your parents said something like, stop crying. Well, obviously when you're crying, you're crying for a reason, you know? So then yes. you're like, oh, I have to stop. I'm not allowed to show my emotions. That's now, one of the biggest things for me. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like when, when we start learning language, we start literally being taught to stop feeling. Use your words. Yeah. If you don't stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Quit right? your belly or again. If, you, if you're going to cry, go to your room. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Those if you're going to have triggers. an emotional response, you have to ice yourself yes from the yes. rest of us because yes. we don't want to be involved in whatever you have going on there now I don't want to say that that's abuse because it's not intentional no it's not it wasn't intentional if that happened to you but your perception of that event may have caused like a loop a feedback mm -hmm. loop that's going on in your mind that puts you in a situation to where as an adult Yes. If something happens that awakens that response, you instantly go back to being that little girl who was locked in her room and told your emotions don't matter. And it plays out most frequently in interpersonal relationships, like husband mm -hmm. and wife or spouse mm -hmm. or, or sisters and brothers, close personal relationships is where that plays out the most. It sure. can also happen at work. Like if your boss Yes. you know, is a little bit demanding, they can trigger those kinds of reactions too. So people as adults don't understand where that emotion is coming from because it's deeply ingrained in their cellular body, like Memory, their DNA yeah. basically. Yeah. And they don't know that that happened to them or, you know, they may know that it happened, but they didn't consider that it could be bubbling up now as an adult right. and causing them to react in a way that's not emotionally uh, proper. I don't know what the word I was looking for was. Um, so that's one of the things that it, people, I just want to raise awareness about because the way you react to people instead of respond to people, like a reaction is something that happens instantly and you can't control it. Yes. A response is something that you do when you've like accepted and been like, okay, I've had a moment to process this. This is my response. But a reaction is something that a toddler does. Yes. A yes. response I actually, is that a healthy adult should do. <laughs> I, I actually had a teacher for many, many years who said children react, adults respond. Mm -hmm. The ability to respond in any given situation is an indication of maturity. Yeah. And people who are reactive just don't have that emotional maturity. And yes. the, when she said that, I, you know, I really looked around and thought there are very few responsible adults around here. 
it, it's difficult. And when you yeah. haven't had good role models to yeah. follow that are emotionally aware, yeah. then you don't really have the skill set and you don't even realize that it's not normal to feel that way. You just instantly go into fight or flight mode. And then this whole series of events happens inside of you. Right. And then, you know, you feel anxious or you feel depressed or you feel abandoned and lonely and not worthy because you were sent to your room. Yeah. Ostracized. Yeah. Yeah. And as a functional medicine doctor, naturopathic doctor, you know, full well, when we internalize too much, what that will do as a chemical response within our body. And if that gets prolonged too long, what that will do in the long term. I mean, it's the sky's the limit to the damage that it can do physically. You yeah. know, when, I, when we're not spiritually, mentally, and emotionally well, there's no way our bodies are going to perform optimally. Right. Right. Well, and that stuff has to come out somehow. And I mean, even doctors are starting to understand that people that have been in toxic situations or abusive relationships are more likely to come down with something like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, or, you know, one of those things that, um, are really hard to diagnose and maybe don't have a cure because it's, it's coming out because it's not even really a medical issue. It's more, yeah, it's, it's not able to be dealt with internally. So it's trying to express itself in another way. Um, and it's, it's becoming more and more widely known and more accepted that people who have those kinds of things need help. They need emotional help to deal with how they ended up where they were. And, you know, like I said, some of those things come from generations. Like I, I talked to someone the other day, um, who was a Dane. She said she was, her family were Danes. And I was like, Wow. So you've got a lot of ancestral like stuff coming down your family tree because they lived in a harsh environment. They were warriors. You know, they have so much stuff going on. Vikings, you know, like if you think about the lifestyle that those people lived just to survive, like survival was hard. I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it really does boil down to understanding your own emotions and starting to recognize, like if something triggers you something, if something causes you to have an emotional response, like you tense up or you freeze, or you instantly feel like you need to attack somebody for something what's underlying there. What Mm -hmm. is, what is the the little person inside of you that was five years old asking for right now? Yeah, I I agree. And that was actually how I started my healing journey when I couldn't find anything. And, you know, there's nothing wrong. You know, all the tests are normal. All the labs are normal. All the scans are normal. Everything's fine. But, you know, here's some antidepressants. (laughs) Yeah, that's That's actually that's what started me on the journey of trying to figure all this out, because I was in my 20s when I got the well, we don't know what's wrong with you. So here, just take these pills. (laughs) <laughs> and I was, I was like, in my twenties as no. well. No, <laughs> yeah. Why? Why am I taking these pills? You just told me there's nothing wrong, right? And the response that I got was, "Well, you know, this one actually stimulates your appetite." I was like, "There's nothing wrong with my appetite. It's what happens when the food goes in." <laughs> yeah, right. We got yeah, something backwards told- here. Okay, bye. Yeah. So- When I was little, I don't remember how old I was, but I remember my mom taking me to the doctor because I had, um, really sensitive stomach. Like it didn't take anything for me to throw up or whatever. And as a child, I threw up a lot and the doctor just said, there's nothing wrong with her. She just has a nervous stomach. Uh And I was like, um, okay, whatever. And I carried that with me into my twenties before I finally was like, you know what? I don't accept that something else uh-huh. is going on. Um, so but he wasn't know. all that wrong. Your nervous system was on overload. Right. But, you know, <laughs> but exactly. But let's, let's figure out why, right? Yes. Not, yes. oh, she'll be fine. She's just got a nervous stomach as I'm, I got so good at throwing up that I would walk oh. down the street and just go, Bleh. 
and then go right back to what I was doing. Oh <laughs> no, no, that yeah. is not normal. No. And I'm emetophobic. So that would be like, what? <laughs> it didn't, after a while, it didn't even slow me down. I was like, whatever. <laughs> oh my gosh. Nobody should have to get good at that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like, I don't, that's just how I am. I, said, I don't know. The doctor said there's nothing wrong with me. So, so what was, what were some of the first things that you did? Did you start reading books? Did you start doing trainings? Did you start, like, if somebody else is watching this and going, how do I even start this? How do you even start to navigate the world of dealing with emotions in a healthy manner? Well, I didn't know how to do that until probably around the time I was 50, <laughs> 53. Now I, um, decided I was going to figure out why I was attracted to situations that were not healthy for me, people, okay. places, whatever. And I decided that I wasn't going to do what I used to do. You know, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different result. Well, I obviously wasn't getting different results. So I needed to look at what I had been doing and not do that anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I had already gotten to the point to where I wasn't really all that interested in drinking alcohol or anything like that, but I kind of made up my mind that I was going to go on an internal journey, <laughs> kind of a quest yeah. to improve my situation. I wanted to figure out what was broken inside of me so that I could become who I was supposed to be, become a better person be happier, be able to like take a compliment without feeling like I shouldn't get one, you know? And I made up my mind that I was going to do this without the help of any alcohol, no substances. I wasn't going to get on Tinder. You know, I wasn't going to do any of those things that distract you from the voices in your head. And I know most of the time when people do that, they're trying to silence the voices in their head that are, you know, screaming for help really, you know, and it was, it was quite a journey. I, I hired a coach okay, and I went through hypnotherapy for a while, which was amazing. And after I was finished with that, I kind of, you know, bumbled along for a while on my own. And I, I took some courses online and I just did some more investigation. And then one day I was on Facebook and I saw, um, my current coach talking about boundaries. And I was like, Ooh, I need some of those. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally had to stalk her because she wasn't all that easy to find. Okay. So I'm like looking her up and I found her on YouTube and I watched a couple of videos and then I went to her Facebook page and I watched what I could find. And finally I just messaged her and I was like, I would really like to talk to you. And she messaged me back and was like, Hey, what's up? Let's get on a call. And I was like, okay, let's do it. And we just really connected. And I loved the way she looked at things and her concept of how people, you know, humans worked and all of the things. And we've been working together for I don't even know how long, 18 months probably. And okay. it's been such a great, a great journey, but it was hard. Like yeah. there were a lot of times when I would just be so sad and so like lonely. And I would just be like, oh, that's it. I'm going to get a bottle of wine or mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the bar yeah. and meet some people. And then I was like, no, 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 no. That's not, no, uh -uh. that's not what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to figure this out. So then I would work through it. I would journal and I would meditate and I would ask her for input and help. And she was great at helping me work through some of the things. And it's great to have a guide yes. to help you walk through this process. Yes. Nobody can do it for you. It yeah. has to be you, but yeah. you can't really do it by yourself because you, you don't have the tools. So you need somebody to help give you tools and lead you in the right direction, but the work has to come from inside of you. And Sorry. it's not always pretty. Sometimes it is so painful and so ugly. Like you said, I, I there were times when I was like, you know what, I'm not doing this. Yeah. And there were times, especially when I was really young, there were times I would leave work 
go to the bar, drink just enough. So I knew that I would be tired enough to fall asleep. And I would just go home and crash out because I just could not deal with the pain that I was feeling. Yeah. And I really understand how people turn to substances or sex or food or whatever, or so because the pain can really be absolutely overwhelming. It is. Yeah. But the triumph is so much better. It's so much sweeter. It's so much more satisfying. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it's like nothing you can even imagine when you're in that pain, you cannot fathom what it's going to be like outside of that, because that's all you feel, right? All you feel is that pain. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I was guilty of is I abused myself so much more than anyone in my life ever did. Yeah. Because I had this revolving door of thoughts, yeah. you know, yeah. just over and over and over again. And, you know, yeah, things have happened to me that weren't nice, weren't pleasant, yeah. weren't, fun, yeah. weren't ideal, but the way I dealt with them and the way I just kept repeating in my head over and over and over again, that cycle, I was torturing myself. And yeah. once I realized that I was the one that was making it worse, right. I was like, oh, I can control this and, and I then, can make it better. Yeah. And then I decided, you know, you know what? I need to raise my daily emotional set point. So instead of being way down here in the basement all the time, I was like, okay, so today I made it up here for five minutes. And then I kind of slowly went back down and then I'm back down here again. And then like a couple of days later, I'd noticed, whoa, I was up here for an hour today. And then I kind of worked my way around and I ended up back down here. And then eventually my daily set point got higher and higher and higher and higher. And I'm to the point now where if something maybe triggering would happen, I'm like, okay, I see that. That would have normally knocked me down for a week. I'm taking 15 minutes right now to feel this. Yeah. I'm going to process it and then I'm going to move on. Yeah. And it, yeah. it it's amazing to get yourself to that point. The triggers don't necessarily ever go completely away, but you have to be emotionally aware enough to know that something is triggering you. You have to see it. And then you have to feel it, which is where the no alcohol and the no, yeah. <laughs> no addiction. You have to be willing to feel. Yeah. Cause if you're yeah. numbing your feelings, you cannot work through them. Right. So, and it's intimidating yeah. to even think about being willing to feel when you've been self-medicating to not feel it's really mm -hmm. intimidating, it is. but you know, I, I joke that I survived on cliches and, and coffee because <laughs> you know, the, that which does not kill us makes it stronger. Even though you feel like it's going to kill you, you have no idea how strong you're going to be on the other side of that. Yeah. You have no idea the strength yeah. that follows well, my conquering your thing. own dark moments and conquering right. your own stinky layers of that onion. You know, you just yeah, keep peeling, peeling up, layers peeling of that onions. onion. Yeah. And yeah, there's going to be a lot of tears when you peer those layers, yeah. but man, when you get that onion chopped and you start cooking and it's making so good, really yeah. great recipes, it's glorious. Yeah. yeah. I was a workaholic. Okay. How did thing. that work for you? Um, it put me into complete adrenal burnout. Oh goodness. Somebody must've got caught on the kennel over there. He must've oh, hurt himself. He's okay now though. <laughs> okay. Um, so you had a burnout. Tell me about that complete adrenal burnout. And I didn't know it. I went to, when I was getting my naturopathic degree, I went through a class and a teacher was ex explaining what it feels like to have adrenal fatigue. And one of the things that she was talking about was it was kind of like some people have this sort of out-of-body experience, like they're floating on a cloud. And I had one, my best friend went with me to this seminar and we were sitting there and I looked at my best friend and I was like, She's talking about me. And she goes, yes, she is. She is 100% talking about you. And I was wow. like, that used to happen to me all the time when I was a teenager. Okay. And I didn't know what it was. I just thought I was like getting ready to fall asleep or whatever. And I just felt that way. But I would go lay in a field in a big old grass field, like wild grass and just lay there and stare up at the clouds. And there were lots of times when I, I kind of felt that disconnected 
from my own body kind of feeling. I had no idea that that was anything until this, I was probably, I don't know, like in my forties somewhere when I learned that, but I had adrenal fatigue at a very young age because of the stress that was in the household that I grew up in. And Then when I got older and I became a workaholic, literally, I was the fixer of all things broken. That was my proud title. Yikes. I worked seven days a week and I would literally, when I left the office, I would say, call me if you need me. I never Mm. said, I'm going home. I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) Those words never came out of my mouth. (laughs) I was always, you know, if you need something available. I'll be there in a moment's notice. You just let me know. I will fix it. And I wore that badge very proudly, the fixer of all things broken. And you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. I have a solid boundary when it comes to that (laughs) because it took my health from me. It will every time. I mean, at some point, somebody's going to have a heart attack or break an ankle so they have to slow down or yeah. break a knee so they have to slow down or heaven forbid, have a car accident so they have to slow down. That's where Life will force illnesses. us to slow down. Yeah, the chronic illness, you know. So I ended up with autoimmune issues and I had zero energy, zero. I used to walk a mile every day before I went to work. I was always in great physical shape. I would walk every evening after work when it was warm outside. like. I was dedicated to being healthy and fit my whole life. And when this adrenal failure kicked in, I literally would get up. I would set my alarm for 6 a.m. I would get up, I would get dressed and I would walk out the front door. And when my feet would hit the sidewalk, I would be like, "Mm, I don't know. I don't think I can do this today. And I was terrified that I was going to get a half a mile from my house and somehow not have the energy to get back home. Yes. I've, I have been there myself. That is not a great feeling. No. And there were times when I did get far from home and have to sit down. Like here I am along a walking trail. Thankfully there's benches. I'm just sitting on a bench watching people walk by because I don't have the energy to go home right now. So I'm just going to sit here until it comes back. Yeah. And the walk home was a lot slower than the walk to get me to that bench. Yes. <laughs> but that scared me so badly that yes. eventually I just wouldn't go. And then I started gaining weight. And then I started seeing that cortisol tummy kick in because what happens when you're stressed, 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 your cortisol kicks up to help you handle that stress. And it also burns calories. So I was skinny, very skinny for most of my adult life. Until I wasn't when my adrenals were no longer able to keep pumping out the cortisol, then I started gaining weight. And the more stressed I was, the more weight I would gain. Right. You know, a lot of people end up with blood sugar balance issues because of that, because the cortisol and insulin and then insulin resistance and like all of the things. And I was on a road to really bad place. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And I, I can already hear a lot of women going, okay, so how do I get rid of the cortisol belly? How, what do I do about my belly? And it's not so much about the belly. <laughs> it's getting right. to the root cause of what caused the cause, the cause. Right. So yeah. yeah, you can, you can do all the diet programs, take all the pills, powders, shakes, and potions, and they will work. There's tons of them out there and they work for a while. But then I was just going to say some of them work for a minute, but they're not the cause. Yeah. So once you have to get used to it or comfortable with it, or you've lost the weight and you maybe get a little more lax with what you were doing, the weight starts to come back Mm -hmm. because the root cause is dealt with. And when it comes to that kind of thing, it's stress, fight or flight, vagus nerve, those things that drive the cortisol pattern. And, um, one of the bad things about having cortisol issues is cortisol and melatonin are opposite. So if your cortisol is always high, you never get any sleep. Yes. And if you're not getting any sleep, you're not getting any rest and restoration. You know, we, when, when we sleep, that's when we do all of the repair. Right. And if you're not getting that good REM sleep, are you ever really repairing? Well, now we're talking about rapid aging. 
We're talking about our organs getting impacted, let alone our brain functioning. We're right. not creating our neurotransmitters the way that we should be. It's a hot mess. Well, and so for an example, for people that are not really sure, um, when you go to sleep, you manage to get to sleep and you wake <laughs> up at 3 a.m. because you have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. That's not why you're awake. Yep. You're awake because your brain detoxes at that time of night. Yes. And so does your liver yeah. and your brain requires glucose to do its job. And without glucose, which is stored in the liver, your brain can't detox. It can't do what it's supposed to do. It can't repair itself. So the brain pokes the liver and says, Hey, I need some glucose. You got some. Wow. And the liver says, mm, no, nope. we're going to have to get it from the muscles, I guess. And it, that process wakes you up. Wow. That's why you're awake in the middle of the night. It's not because you have to go to the bathroom. Wow. I think a lot of people are really going to like that. Yeah. Knowing that that's actually the problem. Yeah. So what do you think they can, I mean, what, to me, the solution is first of all, take care of the root cause of the problems that are going on mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Right. You have to but that also, issue. yeah, absolutely handle the stress issue, but short term, I feel like a little bit of protein before bed can be really helpful. Yes. And taking care of your liver. I mean, there are a lot of people that have, um, what they call non alcoholic, alcoholic fatty, fatty liver, liver yeah. disease. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. basically fatty liver. And yes. when your liver is congested and fatty and your gallbladder isn't functioning well, yes. then it, the liver's so busy doing all of those things that it can't help with the other things. And all of the blood in your body goes through the liver two times yeah. on every heartbeat. It goes through yeah. on the way out and through on the way back. So the liver's yeah. getting double duty on every heartbeat. So there's a lot of stuff going on in your liver. And like we mentioned like methylation and MTHFR and stuff like that. That's all fairly new to yes. us. And still very understood. I was just diagnosed a few years ago and my doctor said, well, just take some B vitamins. You'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's a recipe for disaster right there. <laughs> Like you're going to be kidding me. There's more information on this. I'll find it myself. Thank you. Like I did right. everything else. Yeah. So I'll do respect to doctors out there. Of worms. <laughs> and oh my I gosh, recommend that people tackle methylation issues by themselves. I recommend that they find a doctor who knows about methylation. If they're going to tackle that beast, because it's, it literally is a can of worms and you can pull like one thread and it'll affect something over here. And, you know, then you try to put it back and then it affects something over here. Like yeah. there's a lot to methylation. It is not a simple thing. And it's definitely not as simple as, Hey, take some B12. Cause that's, that can either I just help. love him. So everybody knows he's a puppy and he's not getting the attention that he needs. Right? So we're going to give him a little attention. His name is Mia. But, um, speaking of methylation, one of the things that really changed my whole life was, um, a, a really unique detox binder. And I introduced you to that just a little bit yesterday. Um, I feel like it has really changed my whole life. And for anybody who wants more information on that, they're willing to, they're, they're more than welcome to um, contact me about that. But it, it really is getting to the causes, right? And the cause is not enough attention. <laughs> I'll be right back. The causes are not enough attention to the things that really stress us out and the things that we're not taught how to navigate, the things that we're not taught how to, how to understand. You know, like you said, you were getting back to, like when we're kids, we're taught to walk and talk and read and ride a bike. We are not taught to navigate our feelings, mm -mm. to navigate our emotions we're taught to suppress them. Right. And I, I am the testimony to what happens when you suppress emotion. It does not do a body good. Yeah. So my big thing, I guess, for lack of a better word is, um, not just the nutraceutical company that I share, that's only one component. That's for the physical body to start to get back online, the emotions and the thoughts and the, the, like you said, the, the programming 
in my opinion, they do just as much damage as the toxicity in the air, the toxicity in the water, and the toxicity in our soil. Yeah. Toxic thoughts and toxic emotions are equally as damaging to glyphosate. Yeah. I mean, They're it's crippling, really. It, it really is. So I, if there's anything that I can do is to encourage people to find a way to start, just, just start. Don't get overwhelmed. Even if you, even if the only step you can take right now is drinking more water. Yeah. If that's the only step you can take, start, just do something, something, start drinking water every day. Some people don't drink any water. It's true. Zero. Zero I have a lot of friends who drink coffee and then soda and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Or they'll roll right into alcohol in the evening, but you know, start being willing to feel the emotions and know that you are not going to feel more emotions than you can handle in that moment. Even if it feels like you can't handle it, you can, but just being willing to start yeah. find a support system. You know, if, if you're, if the coach that you work with is willing to share her name, you're more than willing to share that with other people. If she's not, that's fine too. But, you know, find somebody like, like you said, you were online and you resonated with her and you yeah. reached out. Yeah. Well, and I'm taking clients. So if anybody's interested in, in seeing Perfect. if we're a match, then I'm happy to have that discussion as well. Perfect. Um, Cause everybody, you have to find somebody that kind of connects with you emotionally yes. and can understand you. Not every coach doesn't match up to every client. It just it's doesn't true. work that way. You have to find somebody that resonates with you and your spirit. And if somebody wants to know her name, I will, I, I haven't talked to her about that. So I don't really like want to blast her name out anywhere yeah. where it's very big, but if somebody wants to know who she was, I'm happy to share that information. Um, but I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why. So here's the funny thing. Three years ago, I created a program for nutrition and mindset is a 12 week program that for people to go through over the course of 12 weeks to learn how to feed their bodies, how to use their bodies, how to, to get their mindset around nutrition and having a healthy lifestyle. And through this whole entire process, it's a great program. I love it, but I don't really recommend it to people all that much anymore because this work is more important. Like, yes, you need nutritious food. Yes. If you want to buy the program, I will sell it to you. But what I really want to do is talk to you about the toxicity that you have right right here that is keeping you from healing. Yeah. Because you can lose the weight. You can lose a hundred pounds. How many times do people say I lost a hundred pounds and then I gained 40 pounds back? Yes. Yeah. Because they're not getting to the cause. Yeah. It's not because they don't understand how to lose weight. Right. They do understand they were right. extremely successful at losing. Yes. If you lost a hundred pounds, you are a rock star, hundred <laughs> percent rock star. But the reason that you can't keep it off is because of what's going on in here. Yes. And that yes. part has to be dealt with. And unless you can see it and recognize that it's there, then you can't fix it by yourself. You need someone to help you with that journey. I agree. Walk you through it. I agree. So and I think the I this book was to raise awareness for people that maybe don't know. Maybe it'll give some people some food for thought and encourage them. And there's some, some little tricks in the book that you can do on your own to help you grow and heal and get started on your journey. But if it becomes overwhelming, then please find someone to guide you, a coach, a counselor, a therapist, whatever, find somebody. If you're in a situation where you're being abused, there is a 1-800 number that you can call. I don't have it in front of me. It's in the back of my book. (laughs) Um, And it's a nationwide hotline and they give you tools and ideas and resources so that you can get out of the situation that you're in. And I'm not just talking about spousal stuff. There, there are family dynamics where parents and children you know, sometimes it's the child abusing the parent. Sometimes it's the parent abusing the child. And a lot of times those things can be resolved with the right information. Yeah. And do you talk about the generational um, patterning in the book or do you kind of do that more when you're working one-on-one with people? Oh, it's, there's a brief thing about it in the book, just kind of to open the conversation about it because 
you know, there's so much shame that gets passed down from generation to generation. And we don't even know that we're doing it. Um, and when you're 47 years old and you've never taken care of yourself a day in your life, because you feel like you're selfish. If you take the time to go get a haircut or take a shower or, you know, maybe buy yourself something that you want because you feel selfish that was passed down to you from, you know, my grandmother could have easily passed that down to me. Unfortunately, (laughs) I did not receive that from her. Um, but my mom is very selfless, very selfless. She really, really, really focused on raising. She had five children. She focused on raising the children and she didn't put herself first. I can remember as a child when my, my parents got divorced when I was young and there was a pat, there was a period of time where she was single and working and we were latchkey kids. We came home from school. We let ourselves in the house. We took care of ourselves. And there were lots of times we would be sitting at the table eating dinner and she would be standing by the sink. And I'd be like, mom, aren't you going to eat? And she would say, I already ate. She literally lived on one bologna sandwich a day. Wow. I don't know how long. Wow. It's a conversation I'll have to have with her sometime because I'm sure she'll tell me. Um, And speaking of my mom, my mom said to me when she read my book that it gave her the desire to go and live her best life. Wow. That is the highest compliment. Yes. I was, I was like, wow, mom, that's so cool. I'm so, I mean, I didn't realize that you hadn't, but I'm glad we're talking about breaking the generational traumas. Look what you just did. I reversed it. (laughs) So if, if you're in a situation and you think it can't be changed, it can, and it can change just like that. And you've changed it, not just for her and yourself, but your daughter and your grandkids. Yes. And theirs. Yes. I mean, I've, I've worked with this generational patterning and generational trauma for many, many years now, probably like 22 years. And the impact that it has on lives that you never in a million years would have guessed. Yeah. It is truly the most important work we can do. Yeah. And, well, and it just, the ripples just go. Yes. So not only is my daughter an amazing human, I'm really proud of myself. when I talk about raising her, because she turned out amazing. And a lot of it was just luck because I I was 16 when I had her. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes, but we have a fantastic relationship and we can talk about all of these things. And she is helping not only her children, but even her husband who has some things from his childhood that she's helping him deal with. So it's the it's unlimited. The ripples really is. Go so far. And yeah. I read the other day somewhere that, um, what was it there? Your voice can change a cell or an atom in another universe. And I was like, Whoa, that's, deep. that's powerful. Yeah, yeah. That's really powerful. Yeah. And, and you're right. It is a ripple effect. You know, yeah. the, the woman that I worked with for so many years said, you cannot possibly change without the people around you changing to some extent. It, you yeah. can't. Right. So uh, the work that we do is never just for us. Yeah. The the ripple, like you said, the ripple can extend so far beyond our comprehension yeah. that then it becomes almost our job right. to heal. Yeah. My healing I'm is yours passionate. and your healing is mine. And right. Yeah. It's so just important. That connection is amazing. And yeah. I've been telling people for the last few days, cause I had a post on Facebook that got really popular really fast. And I've told several people in the last few days, uh, something that I never really understood. And I don't know who quoted this, but a rising tide raises all ships. Okay. I never really understood what that meant until now, as you raise your vibration, as you become someone better, the people yes. around you are affected by your behavior and your frequency, and they come with you. They come with you or they fall out of your life. Yes. If they're not ready, if they have too much trauma and they just don't, they're not willing to they're take just not there yet. Yeah. Yes. Then they're just not there yet. They're on their own journey. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. But you know, when you affect the lives of other people, sometimes you don't even know you did it. No. 
No. I get messages on Facebook all the time. Girl, you inspire me. I appreciate you. Please keep doing what you're doing. They're not going to say that publicly. Right. You know, they don't want other people to know that they told me that, but I affect it. But them. it matters. Yeah. It, it matters, you know, because a lot of times you don't know if people are even listening. And then yeah. you get a message and somebody says, I, I think this saved my life. Yeah. Or I, I, I I'm, I'm doing this now, you know, whatever it is that they're, they're going to, whatever change it is that they're going to make. Yeah. I've had it matters. Tell me, I'm going back to school. I'm going to get my master's degree because you inspired me to do it. And I'm like, really? Wow. That's awesome. Good for you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Go for it. That's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. So how can people find you? What is the best way to find you? The easiest way to find me is to search for ask Dr. Annette. That's my Instagram and Facebook handle. Okay. Um, and that's the easiest two ways to find me. Of course, I'm on TikTok and those things too, but um, that's the easiest way to reach me is that way. Okay. I have a couple of different Facebook groups. I have one called the Frequency of Change, where we talk Ooh. about vagus nerve, things like that, how to you know deal with that if you're stuck in fight or flight. That's a great group to get in. And then Love I it. also have my main group, which is Your Healthy Lifestyle with ask Dr. Annette and that group, there's lots of recipes and nutritional stuff. And there's getting ready to be a bunch of emotional healing stuff in there. Yay! Um, but yeah, so I have, there's lots of ways to get with me. I'm doing a book club. If anybody wants to get in on the book, they can get the book and join the book club. We're going to talk about like five chapters at a time. It's four weeks long. It happens on Mondays. Anybody's welcome to join that as well. Um, I'm not a licensed therapist. Um, I am just somebody who's been through the gauntlet and came right. out the other side. And right. like we said yesterday, carrying a torch for right. everybody who wants to find their way out of the darkness. So that's my passion. That's my desire. That's my goal. And people keep asking me if I'm going to write another book. The answer is yes. I just have to get through uh, all of this first because it's been a whirlwind. Well, this one's just hot off the presses, right? Yes. It's been a whirlwind. I've been amazed. At and you're already at number 18 on what list? It was the, hold on. I got to look women's at women's self spiritual, personal, spiritual growth, women's personal, spiritual growth. That's what it was. I, and seriously, has it been a week yet that this book came out? Uh, the 23rd of January. Okay. So it's been a few minutes, but it is still brand spanking new and they can find it on Amazon. Yeah. Is that right? It's on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. And I'm working to get it into bookstores soon. It's also on Kindle. Um, I self-published and I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> so I'm learning as I go, which has been fun, but that's kind of the way I am. I'm kind of a here now I'll just do it myself. Um, <laughs> but, I do too. Uh, yeah. So hopefully, uh, within the next few months, you can find it at bookstores. I don't really know how that works. And I'm sure that bookstores get to choose what books they put on their shelves. So that's a whole nother process that we'll have to, I'll have to figure out. And I might eventually have to find somebody to help me with all of that. I don't really yeah. know, yeah. but my goal right now is to raise awareness and open people's hearts and minds to, the fact that they have control, they can choose a better life and it takes a little bit of work, but it's possible. And it's so worth it. So worth it, it is so worth it. You got to see it. You got to heal it and you got to release it. And it is so, so, so worth it. it yeah. It's, it's giving you your own life back. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. And not only yours, the people around you as well. When you right. heal yourself, other people just magically change. It's true. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not a rumor. <laughs> it's not, it's not. Yeah. And so if you have children or, you know, family members that you're concerned about doing the work for yourself benefits them as well. It's everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's everything. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It was um, so much fun. I could talk about this all day. So me too. Me too. That's yeah. why I started doing this. <laughs> yeah. well, hopefully we hit all the points we wanted to hit. And I, I do need to go check out 
those supplements that you mentioned, because I'm yeah. curious about those yeah. myself. So thank you for sharing that. And if anybody's interested in talking to me, just reach out. All right. And all of Annette's information will be um, tagged right along with this video. So reach out to her for the book, how to get started on your healing journey. And may you all be blessed. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Bye day. for now.